You ever notice how the premise of The Simple Life is essentially the same plan that Pol Pot had? <laughs> yeah. Take rich people, put them in the fields. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's kid gloves, Pol Pot. I think that's what's so satisfying about watching mm-hmm. it. True. Love class warfare. <laughs> Just without the killing fields. It's Britney, bitch. And uh, the Iraq everywhere, like, such as. I'm supposed to be the franchise player, and we're in here talking about practice. What's that? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Out, Charlie! Out! Our next door neighbors are foreign countries. I call upon all nations to do everything they can to stop these terrorist killers. Thank, Thank you. you. Now watch this drive. Hey, everybody. It's your Remember Shuffle. My name is Ben. With me is my co host, Jordano. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I was waiting for the voice this week. There was only one way it was going to go. And today we are joined by second time returning guest, Sam. Say hi, Sam. Hello. So great to have you back. Also known as at thank you for shopping on Instagram. You may remember Sam from our hipster episode. Mm-hmm. Just an expert on so many subjects. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you want to come on again? I think I just listed one thing. I was like, oh, how about Paris Hilton? You're like, yeah, <laughs> Like that was the end of the discussion. I- <laughs> I also feel like you were just talking about it casually at the bar and I just wouldn't shut up. Like I just kept going. We will be discussing the socialite, heiress, bomb ass business bitch, reality <laughs> TV star, it girl, Paris Hilton. We see the analytics. We know precisely who you are. We know this is probably not the topic you were expecting, but I think we are going to have a lot of fun with this. Jordana really is the creative mind behind this episode so Jordana walk (laughs) us through why we're doing this yeah she really is a very fascinating figure for so many reasons and very emblematic of the 2000s the most famous thing that's said about her all the time is that she is the first influencer and so one thing we want to do on this episode is get into what does that mean exactly why do people call her that why is it significant and then I also think she's very interesting because of the way that people thought about her back then and how that's changed (laughs) because I think that Mm -hmm. Paris Hilton is a great heel you know what a heel is in wrestling that they're made to play the villain the person that people love to hate and Mm -hmm. in the 2000s it was a great fail son decade like the aj sopranos of the world were doing very well we had a fail son president in george bush and Mm -hmm. we talked about this on our rest of development episode we talked about this in our office episode with andy bernard and i'm not saying that paris hilton is a fail son because she has hundreds of millions of dollars but that's the way that people saw her and that coupled with the insane toxic masculinity of the era, I think was a really noxious and odious mixture in the 2000s because the Paris Hilton sex tape, I did not realize this, just to give you an example, the opening frames of that are that her ex-boyfriend, Rick Salomon, dedicated the revenge porn sex tape to the victims of (laughs) 9-11. It's so amazing. It's it's really a perfect snapshot of the time. We were just so brain damaged from 9-11 that we had to put it in like the sex tape. And as Jordano said, a revenge porn sex tape. Mm -hmm. Paris Hilton did not (laughs) consent to this thing being released. But it is deeply awful what happened with that sex tape. Well, she was very drunk. Yeah, she was a teenager. Yeah, she was a teenager. She never saw a dime for it. But the Adult Video Awards, the AVN Awards, gave this tape three awards to the revenge porn thing. (laughs) Best overall marketing campaign, individual product. Best renting title of the year and the best selling title of the year so they tried to do right by her (laughs) oh my god she was on the new york post right front page of the new york post when her parents were leaving the hotel that morning nikki had to wake up early and turn all the papers over because paris hilton's sex tape was worthy of the front page Mm -hmm. in 2004 and that's where i would just add one more thing to what jordano says and we'll elaborate on this point in full but this is the way in which paris is a quote-unquote fake fail son or fail daughter, right? Yes, she's still worth hundreds of millions of dollars and she's still pulling for the bill and she's probably going to get there with all of her brands and influencing. But I think for a lot of people, the sense of being a fail son, of not rising up to the level of accomplishment of your parents or grandparents, for her, it's the shame, right? She may be rich, but for a lot of people, she's not going to be some titan of industry. She's always going to 
be Paris Hilton who had the sex tape. And what makes it interesting is the 2000s is this decade where we slashed inheritance taxes and famously don't have any class politics at all. Bush is going to cut the death taxes. And what we have instead of class politics is that we can look at Paris Hilton being frivolous as someone with money and go, what a stupid, she should read a book instead of going to the club. She's such a spoiled brat. I can't believe she would do this. What is, oh, she makes me so angry. She's such a dumb blonde. Oh, this girl. Yeah, we all like reveled in it. Oh, uh, everybody. Yeah. There's a joke at the 2007 VMAs of Sarah Silverman and Paris Hilton is in the audience right before she has to go to jail. And Sarah Silverman says, oh, Paris Hilton is going to jail tonight. And to make her feel more comfortable there, they're replacing the prison bars with penises. And Paris Hilton is in the audience. And Sarah Silverman says she immediately regretted the joke because the second that she finished the punchline, she could hear the audience not take it in a fun way, but take it in a like a yeah, look at her. <laughs> Dude, even quote unquote feminist artists, someone like Pink, who has a big girl power mentality, had a music video called Stupid Girls where one of the lyrics to that song and this is like baked in my memory whatever happened to the dreams of a girl president, she's dancing in the videos with 50 Cent is a thing that Pink said. And in this stupid Stupid music video that is literally just calling other women stupid. The song's called Stupid Girls. There are shots of Paris Hilton sex tape. Not the actual tape, but someone like parodying it. Everyone wanted to rip into this young woman. Yeah, and I think that a big part of Thousand's mentality at that time, there was still that mentality of I'm not like the other girls. Even baked in with quote unquote feminism, you still were like <laughs> oh, I'm kind of like the guys. And I don't mean for this to be a hagiography of Paris Hilton. I'm not going to be saying that she's actually the goodest business bitch of all time i am i, I i've come around I, <laughs> i'm gonna be i'm gonna be the paris hilton simp on this episode i think that she is as hardworking as she is greedy and you know conrad <laughs> hilton is very much alive in her and she drinks a lot of dumb bitch juice that we'll talk about <laughs> later the money helps her feel secure jordano after her history of abuse okay <laughs> whom's amongst us <laughs> And I got in a big argument with my mother about this last night <laughs> because my mom was like, she wasn't a heel. Everybody loved her in the 2000s. And I'm like, you're wrong. I read through the tabloids and they were they all had a negative tone. And she's like, no, we were like, oh, good. She's having a good time. Just like I would do if I was rich. <laughs> I was like, shut up, mom. You're wrong. It's also just like, I mean, we did like love her, but we loved her because we hated her, I right. guess. Yeah. We were making fun of her. That's like what it was. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so that is, I feel like the figure that she was in the 2000s is someone that we could look down on for being lower brow than her aristocratic background would suggest she should be. Yeah, it's the economic bargain. The social contract that we were offered is, are you ever <laughs> going to get universal health care? No. <laughs> are you ever going to get a universal basic income? Absolutely fucking not. Are we going to stop the wars? No. <laughs> are we going to raise taxes on the uber wealthy? Also no. But you get to slut shame this one rich lady. <laughs> Pretty and it's going to be fun. It's going to be great <laughs> pretty sick bargain her name is a city so you can make some puns like one night in paris when we do revenge porn on her i don't know <laughs> kind of a brilliant name to be honest <laughs> yeah there actually is a paris hilton and, and when she went on david letterman wait there actually is a paris what there's a hilton hotel in paris oh okay okay yeah, yeah. and I, I believe when she went on david letterman yeah letterman was like uh so uh you know what's had more people in it the, uh, you or the paris hilton and I was like yeah, David Letterman, too, a 50-year-old man who at the same time is coercing his young interns into sleeping with him. Like, multiple interns. And he's the one who's like, you're a bit of a slut, uh, from what I understand. Uh. <laughs> Using his elbows and, like, hitting you, you know. <laughs> Am I right? Am I right? <laughs> you're a little slut, huh? <laughs> okay, so the, the format of this episode will be, first, I'll talk about Paris's life from childhood to when she turns 18, and then I'll talk about Paris as a model and socialite and then we'll do a, a pretty long segment on the simple life as a, as a show because i think it's a good show and then we'll get into themes as we usually do so we'll talk about paris and being class transgressive we'll talk about influencer culture and what it means to be famous for being famous and then we'll just get into it girls generally and, and what they have to 
to say about the times and some of the fashion that Paris is known for. Our main sources for research for this episode were watching The Simple Life, watching a documentary called This is Paris, and Giordano, I believe, read some of her autobiography. Is that correct? I read the whole book, yeah. Good God. So those are the primary <laughs> sources that we use for research on this. I also watched a bit of the new reality show she has called Paris in Love, which my mom forced me to watch over Christmas. It's <laughs> horrible. <laughs> it's like unwatchable. I don't think you understand her, dude. I don't think you understand her like I do. We'll get into it when we talk about The Simple Life. So we'll start with Paris Hilton's life. So she grew up in a lesser branch of the Hilton family, which is wild because I think her dad owned and operated the Ritz-Carlton in New York. But her parents and her sister keep saying that she grew up as a tomboy, although there's a lot of footage of her doing fashion shows as a child. It might push back a little bit on that. There's also a lot of bratty behavior in that doc, and I credit her for leaving it in, where she didn't get the right color present on Christmas, so she's not talking to her father. I would also add to her early childhood the doc makes clear that and i think this is part of what fucked her up from such an early age her parents said you absolutely under no circumstances can go into either modeling or acting but everyone in her family only praised her for her looks her movie star looks <laughs> they called her star right that yeah, was not, like did. it's like okay her star what do you like what else are you supposed to do <laughs> yeah, what the fuck is that supposed to do to a child's brain is like here's the thing that you are perfect for genetically and personality <laughs> wise but we will not let you do that and no wonder no wonder she acted out this is the um childless guy who's parenting advice section of the show it's funny though when you watch the doc it, the mom is like oh we we thought she was going to be a veterinarian and blah 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 and then she hit 13 and everything like that's just classic <laughs> child like, yeah. teen. Like, like as if it was just like she was like a monster or something it's like no it's just mm -hmm. yeah my parents had a lot of hopes for me as well <laughs> I feel like people can project things onto their kids. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when she turns 14, yeah, she starts socially sort of becoming who she's going to be. This is around the time, too, where she writes her famous catchphrase, that's hot, into a cheerleader gossip book that she keeps. And she believes that's hot to be a positive affirmation that she can say about anything. And things start happening to Paris, unfortunately, from a very young age. Her teacher starts calling her at home to talk often and eventually visits her at at home when her parents aren't home and kisses her in the driveway and her parents show up and the teacher freaks out and drives away and at that point her parents decide that she has to move to Palm Springs because she can't be around here anymore. Her parents famously sweep a lot of stuff under the rug. They don't really believe in talking about things. Classic rich <laughs> yeah. behavior. Yeah, like, like, I don't want to deal with this. Yeah. So go live with your grandmother in Palm Springs. You know what I feel is the answer to this teacher who attempted to molest you? A different boarding school where there'll be even less oversight. <laughs> It will be even farther from you. We can't watch you. It'll be great. Yeah. <laughs> So she goes to live with her grandmother and she's being social. She's not coming home. And at 14, she is the victim of sexual violence from a guy she meets at the mall who like roofies her and brings her back to his place. At this point, her parents move to New York and she decides to go with them. And this is where Paris sort of reaches her final form. She's like 16. She's going out all night. She's wearing these fun, crazy outfits. She's dancing. She's getting photographed by the paparazzi. Her parents can't stop her. She sneaks out or she just doesn't come home after school and and they tell her, do you know what we've been imagining with you out all night? There are predators out there. You could be killed. And mom does add, you could be kidnapped, i.e. because we are wealthy. I think there's also that angle. Love because that. of our extreme wealth, you you are a target for kidnapping. And then they just kidnap her themselves, basically. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. amazing work. Yeah. yeah. You can't fire me. I quit. It's like how bald <laughs> guys shave your head. Yeah. You can't kidnap our daughter if we kidnap her first. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. You got to spend money to make money sometimes. Paris responds to these claims by saying, no one is going to mess with me. I mean, Holy her parents shit. are sleeping on the floor in front of her door and they can't stop her. She keeps sneaking out. Drama. Know? Yeah. And so her parents, yeah, hire the troubled teen industry to kidnap her <laughs> in the middle of the night and bring her to one of these like, synanon camps that like Brace Belden and Chet Hanks went to in the Rocky Mountains. And if you know anything about these places, life fucking sucks there. You 
you get these abusive people in power. There's no oversight. Your parents have signed over the custodial rights to you so they can do whatever a parent could, meaning hold you there against your will. Paris Hilton runs away multiple times only for the police to eventually find her and then return her to the camp because the camp has her custodial right. And so that's who you return a runaway to. And she sometimes gets a hold of a payphone and calls her parents and is like, you have to get me out of here. I'm being abused. And her parents suck. Sometimes she calls them from the camp and the counselors there are like, do not say anything about how bad it is. And she's like, okay, no, I won't. I just want to say hi. And then of course- That's hot. That's hot. (laughs) (laughs) And as soon as the phone line is open, she's like, mom and dad, you have to get me out of here. They're abusing me. Before they hang up and are like, you're in solitary confinement for that little outburst. As punishment, they will often send her to the gynecologist's office to have fingers inserted inside what? of her. Sorry, what? <laughs> yeah. That what? It's like one of the forms of punishment. He's like, you don't want another gynecologist appointment, do you? So unusual. Oh, yeah. These places are fucked up. They often will watch her shower as a punishment as well. I love that they're just, in- they're just perverts. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to get you by watching you shower. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good one. Yeah. <laughs> that would bother me. I don't know. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, yes, but it's just so transparent at the same time. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. It's wild that they're still operating. Yeah, there's solitary confinement here. Yeah, they take off your clothes and they make you sit in a cold room for like 18 hours at a time, freezing with no stimulation. They actually transfer her to the worst, like the maximum security facility in Provo, Utah, and they have to fly there to get there. And when she's at the San Francisco airport, she decides to make a break for it there because they're in like a public place. And so she elbows her counselor and runs to the Hilton that's in the San Francisco airport and tells the Mater D or whatever. <laughs> the <laughs> airport Mater D? <laughs> it's the Hilton Hotel in the airport. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, the concierge. American Airlines. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mater D. Mater D, yeah. I haven't flown since 1955. Do they still have a Mater D? <laughs> they do, yeah. And you could smoke the cigarettes there with them. Yeah. <laughs> She tells the concierge that my boyfriend is chasing me and he said he's going to kill me. And so the Hilton temporarily is able to keep her safe. But eventually the police show up and they're like, yeah, this guy has the custody rights for this woman. So you, you have to you have to give her back. And they take her to Provo. Give me the woman. I don't want any <laughs> trouble. Just hand over the woman. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with this? <laughs> this is an entire industry. What the hell? <laughs> they're like, oh, yeah, that's his woman. And so she actually calls her parents from that Hilton and is like, Like, mom and dad, you have no idea what's going on with these fucking people. And her parents tell her, listen, once you're 18, which is in like 11 months, nobody can keep you anywhere against your will. And so this is the only opportunity we have to save you is to do it before you're 18. So we have to leave you there because these places, they coach the parents on what they can say and not say. Yeah, it's just profoundly fucked up. Rich wasp non-parenting. In the doc, Paris says her parents stand there and watch her get kidnapped. Like... I don't hear a lot about what interventions mom and dad tried with their daughter, from the doc at least. It kind of seems like they gave up and they're like, I think it's time to let the cult handle it. (laughs) (laughs) And supposedly they were like crying and watching, which I'm just like, what? So then why don't you stop it? What do you mean? I just don't get it. It's so bizarre. Did you try going to family therapy? Did you try talking to your daughter even once? Did you try looking her in the eye? Dad doesn't even appear in the documentary and they're like, yeah he's always been a little bit cold and aloof or whatever the fuck (laughs) and it's like i don't know man it seems like a very like in the same way that rich people used to hire both wet nurses and nannies to handle the children until they were interesting it seems like this cult seems above board let's get her in the compound you know let's see what happens she has a good relationship with her parents today which is so crazy the mom seems the mom's insane yeah okay okay yeah (laughs) yeah paris should hate her family yeah at least if you joined jonestown you had good politics and got a cool Kool-Aid related death. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mm. Well, struggle session now and then never hurt anybody, but too much, you know? Yeah, she, she plays the game a lot at uh, the camp. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the game that they run at these camps where basically you go around a circle and you just have to attack each other and you just say, like, you're a stupid, spoiled and you'll never amount to anything and you fucking suck. And that's their way of correcting you as a person, which is... <laughs> 
insane. <laughs> While attacking, too, is so sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That'll yeah. fix her. Yeah, they play a little hunger game. <laughs> so, yeah, so she gets out at 18 years old. It's 1999. <laughs> Did she say it like that? I'm sorry. 1999? 1999. It's 1999. It's, uh, we're going to do it like it's 1999. It's, no, it's, great. No, I'm no. setting the scene. I'm, you're, it's I'm New set, York I'm, City. I'm in the scene. I'm in the scene. Yeah. I'm immersed. It's, it's, uh, Everybody's looking up at them towers being like, <laughs> good to see ya. Y'all are always going to be with me. My lodestar, my rock, uh-huh. my compass. It's 1999. And she signs with Donald Trump's modeling agency. So shout out Donald Trump for giving Paris Hilton a chance. <laughs> and she is working as a model and she's going out a lot she's getting noticed for her outfits she has this really fun way of dressing where it's a lot of flashy colorful outfits we'll get more into her fashion later rhinestone city exactly Mm. yeah rhinestones a lot of fuzz she's really known for her fit glasses always sunglasses big ass glasses that women used to wear in the 2000s to hide half their face and she does this very famous david lachapelle photo shoot who's a famous fashion photographer in vanity fair and the point of the photo shoot is to be like we're going to mix eyebrow and lowbrow aesthetic and so paris hilton sneaks the entire photography team against her parents wishes into the hilton's penthouse where they do a photo shoot of paris hilton in essentially like a mesh top where she's basically topless and you know she's got the short skirt and so it's this mix of the very high class penthouse and the streetwear that she's wearing and that's kind of what the vanity fair write-up is about this mix of, of two different worlds so she's starting to get known for that type of aesthetic and this is when we get the simple life well the sex tape is filmed before the simple life yeah the sex tape is filmed with her ex-boyfriend it's not released until after the simple life comes out which i feel like is a thing a lot of people get wrong they're like oh she's famous for her sex tape my mom even said that yesterday and i was like no that came out after the simple life that came out in 2004 so she was already notable and they only did the simple life because there already was something of a paris hilton mania but in the this is paris doc her social media manager got said he built an entire paparazzi empire on Paris Hilton and at the peak of Paris Hilton mania a photo of her in some kind of compromising position could go for between $50,000 and a million I think is what he said depending on the level of how compromised she was so he said at any one time I had a hundred photographers a hundred paparazzi ready to stalk Paris Hilton because she was from this titans of industry business royalty and there was this feedback loop where the more outrageously she act with the clubbing with the modeling with the photo shoot where she's breaking into her family's properties and posing topless the worse she acted the more attention she got and i'm sure she was aware of feedback loop right because it just kept happening yeah at one point outside of the mesh top shot there was another one where she's just wearing a regular shirt and she's laying down and the assistant actually came over and pulled her top down and then they snapped the picture Really? Um, and that was also mm. used in the spread. Yeah, so she just had this reputation, I feel like, and whether that was warranted or not, it's like by other people. It's by like Dave LaChapelle and his team and then the sex tape and et cetera. Not that she wasn't dressing kind of raunchy, but it's just still, I feel like a lot of it was imposed by other people around her. In some that, and I think she understood the role that she was sort of playing. Like she mm-hmm. is a, a good business person. And I think that she understood why people were getting riled up over her and played into that. She does that voice. And you see that in the doc where she can turn that voice on and off, the baby voice. Mm -hmm. To a certain extent, she's playing a character that she knows people want to see. She said she plays a character. And we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but people who knew her at the cult camp compounds that she was at said that she was like one of the brightest in the class. And when she acts like the dumb blonde in The Simple Life, that is the character that people want to see. Oh, yeah. Dumb, boundary pushing, outrageous, whatever. Yes, slutty in the language of the time. But she was giving the people what they wanted and they wanted that particular role no one cared who i was till i put on the mask so moving on to the simple life she really embraces this role of being the helpless rich girl you know because Mm -hmm. we know that she's actually like a very strong person she went through a year and a half of this provo camp where she had to use a mop all the time and she knew what walmart was and then you see her in the simple life and and she's very much playing up how ignorant she is Mm -hmm. and the premise of this reality tv show 
show, which is very good, by the way. I would really highly recommend the first season. I had a great time rewatching it because it has a great premise. And I miss when reality TV had a premise, which was like, hey, these are socialites that we're making live in Arkansas. Because now every reality TV show is like, here are some rich women and the fake lives that we're going <laughs> to pretend they live. My mom makes me watch all the Real Housewives and it like drives me insane. It depends on which one you're watching. I watch all of them. And I, I like to watch one or two Doubt. usually. There's not enough hours in the day to watch all of them. I haven't seen like them. Toronto or Vancouver or something. But Utah like, is really good. Yeah, Utah is awesome. I love that girl who had to marry her grandfather. Okay. I know. <laughs> and it's like so casual. It's like not, it's like, yeah. I love New Jersey, obviously. Teresa Guaducci, RIP. You know? Yeah, love her. Wait, how did she die? She didn't die. She went to prison, right? Yeah, uh, she didn't die. <laughs> I would love to be the we're the first people to drop that. Like she's actually dead. She's dead to me for what she did. <laughs> Listen, hold Tax on. Tax fraud. Yeah. This episode's dropping in seven days. It might be real by then. You know, yeah. this is a dangerous place. So menacing. Are you trying to do something bad? Yeah, I don't. We're, yeah. we're going to kill <laughs> Teresa Guadici. Yeah. I just learned who this person was. <laughs> she's like a very Italian style woman. She's You're a perfect welcome. woman. Yeah, exactly. mm. <laughs> that is your, your favorite type of person. <laughs> Yeah, it is. As Staten a Staten Island. Island person. I thought you were yeah. going to say that is you. That's <laughs> you. Like, you wish you were Teresa Guadagni. I do. I do. <laughs> anyway, let's just riff on The Simple Life a little bit because I think it's a great show because there's basically two premises that they kind of laugh at, which is look at these girls struggle, but also <laughs> look at how much of a yokel the family that she has to live with is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like they do a little both sidesing, but. Yeah, it is true trash reality TV. Inject it right in my veins. It's not weepy Netflix queer eye reality. Reality TV. When I first watched it, I was like, think of every 1950s misogynist stereotype about women. It's like, women do be shopping, women do be dumb, women do be not be driving. <laughs> <laughs> and that is what the simple life is like. Their first challenge is to drive. And we just watch women struggle <laughs> driving a stick shift pickup for like a bit. Regularly, every episode is like, they don't even have credit cards. Because apparently it's like the intro to the Jetson, where mom Jetson steals the husband's wallet instead of the money he gives her for shopping. Think about the last time a boomer told you a dumb blonde joke. And that is this show. Mm -hmm, definitely. Which is very funny. But also their friendship, Nicole yeah. and Paris, is so fun. They're so fun. And they're so great. Mm -hmm. To watch. And that's to me the real value of the show is first of all, I think that Nicole Richie, I'm in love with her after Perfect. seeing that show. I think that she's such a key piece of that show. You probably think of Paris Hilton, but you actually need Nicole a lot more for that show because Nicole is so fun and flirty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's hilarious. You can take away their credit cards and you can take away their money, but you can never take away the fact that they're fun, beautiful girls. And at the end of the day, they don't need anything else. And that's the premise of the second season where they have to get across the country without any money they'll stop at a toll booth and nicole richie will just get out of the car and go to the car behind them and be like can we have twenty dollars <laughs> and when he takes out 20 she goes can i have actually two of the twenty dollar bills <laughs> and the guys will just give it to her because they're fun beautiful women and who doesn't love fun beautiful women the people in this town will just acquiesce to their will and so they're going around this small town in arkansas doing jobs they have to work at a fast food restaurant or they have to work at like a gas station dairy farm yeah and they can't focus for very long so they end up getting into shenanigans <laughs> because this might be a great time to mention that both paris and nicole have children's minds <laughs> they have the minds of children mm -hmm. so i would add to what jordano said people just give the money because they're beautiful women and they're fun and people sense that they would maybe be mentally unfit to testify because of their <laughs> childlike brains or sorry the characters that they are playing the exaggerated versions of themselves yeah like in the episode where they work at the fast food restaurant and they have to change the sign to say half price burgers they change it to what is it anal salty wieners half oh, off or like something that's so that. sick <laughs> it's so great <laughs> it rocked good clean comedy mm -hmm. but they do shenanigans and japes in the first episode there's a scene where paris <laughs> talks to the three-year-old of the host family and it really does seem like they're intellectual equals for a moment <laughs> the show presents them as intellectual staring, at equals. The <laughs> staring at a mirror basically yeah, yeah. <laughs> And anytime someone is meant to stop them from doing shenanigans, if they send a man, he's basically powerless. I remember this this <laughs> one scene where like this big country guy from Arkansas, he's like a big slob. <laughs> 
he drives up to them and is like hey girls and nicole richie's like oh my god you work with your hands like, what do you do for work and he's like i'm a truck driver and she's like oh my god that's so hot i love a man who works on a truck and she like, seems sincere and the guy is just completely disarmed just putty yeah just exactly putty. <laughs> exactly yeah. Yeah. shout out to lionel richie by the way for just adopting his friend's daughter who didn't have any money <laughs> wait what that, really? i didn't know that yeah oh yeah so nicole richie is lionel richie's adopted daughter because his bandmate was a drug addict and didn't have any money and he was like oh i'll just take i'll take your daughter and that's <laughs> how nicole like richie dog. Like, <laughs> like, oh, you don't want this bitch i mean <laughs> yeah i'll just take her i guess <laughs> yeah a lot of passing around of women on this episode more mm-hmm. than i expected to happen <laughs> mm-hmm. also lionel richie clearly a great father because he also has a younger daughter who's now like a massive social media star so shout out to uh, sophia richie so yeah really great show it's just fun to see them get into shenanigans because you get a sense for what they were like at this age because they're troublemakers they can't stop mm-hmm. just causing trouble and anytime you try to discipline them they are the world's best people at, at disarming you like oh I'm, i didn't know they're that helpless. that's what you meant yeah exactly yeah. Mm-hmm. and i think they're they're slightly nicole at least is slightly socially more um what's the opposite of inept is it apt yeah yeah there we go socially et yeah ben speaks six languages by the way (laughs) (laughs) listen we we all get a a freebie sometimes but yeah at the end of the first episode she's the only one who can express gratitude she thanks the host family even though she's going to be kind of bratty and a troublemaker and mischievous she has enough social awareness to be like oh we're so honored and grateful to be in your home at the end of the first episode i was like oh thank god right yeah whenever they approach a new group like if they go to the bar or a new job or something nicole is always the first person to go see so she goes yes. in first and start and then paris will come and it's a, it's a great one-two punch of fun flirty nicole richie and then the model paris Hilton. yeah and they egg each other on it's, it's really great yeah i mean i love when they go to the old lady quilting in the church basement and nicole richie actually she's like i'm horny are any of your sons or grandsons hot yeah and one of the old ladies is like <laughs> yes it's perfect they meet these boys in town like young 18 year old guys and they're like hey as long as we have to be here because it's a challenge the whole reality show is premised on can they survive here for 30 days so they meet these boys and they kind of get boyfriends or whatever and their go-to flirting line by the way if there's any women listening a great flirting line apparently which nicole richie uses devastatingly all the time is to ask like have you ever done any modeling <laughs> so she'll walk up to this guy in well, Arkansas, like touching them too yeah, and be yeah. Like, have you ever done any modeling yeah, right. and they'll be like no not me looks at shoes like <laughs> yeah, looks yeah. down yeah <laughs> It's a great line. And mm-hmm. he meets this young twink sort of guy and uh, they start hanging out with him. And <laughs> Paris Hilton reveals in her book that that kid that she dates, quote unquote, gay. no, that he's an executive <laughs> at Netflix now. Oh, he's what? Sorry. An executive at Netflix. I now. bet it was Damn, her. good yeah. for him. She helped him. She told him you should go to Hollywood and become a model. There you go. That one experience with Paris yeah. just uh, set up his life. <laughs> and then he became straight it- after. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, on the first episode, the host family that they stay with has a, a teenage son who's like 18 or whatever. And Paris and Nicole are talking about this kid on camera. And I paused The Simple Life. I went into my notes and I just wrote, do you think they deflowered this hillbilly? Do you think he had a threesome with these two? No. And then I unpaused the video and literally the next line was Nicole Richie saying like, we should have a threesome with him. <laughs> you and joke. Nicole Richie, one and the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think Paris is as sexual as she seems to be. I think no. she's a fairly asexual person, but she plays it up. Well, because she's so weird. Right. Like mm-hmm. her feeling, she just feels like a weird person. Well, yeah, by her own admission, she's like, I didn't really have a childhood. And so she doesn't want to grow up, right? When the doc came out, it was before she got married and had children with a surrogate. But she's like, I don't want to get married because that means growing up and I'm not ready to grow up. You can also see it in how much she loves, loves, loves animals more than she loves people. I don't know. I see some profound trauma in Paris Hilton. Well, she doesn't trust anyone. Yes, so it makes sense. exactly. Yeah. Yes. So by the time this show gets to season three, it's unwatchable. So bad. They're doing the cheesiest reality TV sound cues like. Mm? <laughs> <laughs> 
every time. It just, it's overproduced. No, it's not even a premise because the premise in the first two seasons is can these stupid spoiled girls survive in Arkansas for a month or whatever? In the third season, it's like, we're going to put them in different internships and then give them grades and see how they do. But it's like, okay, they're just going to take an F every week because they don't care about grades. It's kind <laughs> yeah. of their whole thing. Like, Famous also, honor be, roll student. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, like I couldn't survive in Arkansas. Dude, if you didn't have to answer emails though, think about that. No emails? In Arkansas, there's no emails, famously. <laughs> <laughs> emails just don't reach there. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I could do it. I could live the simple life. <laughs> mm -hmm. You should do a show, you and Jordano. Yeah, we're finally <laughs> taking the shuffle boys out of the ivory tower. <laughs> The Shuffle Boys? That's, I think, what some people have called us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Took me a second. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> we did not give ourselves at least two posters I don't have know called us that. Two to true. three posters. <laughs> I feel yeah. like it just, I feel like you guys have we just been secretly. the receipts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I want to say this joke and Sam, you can be the judge if it's too edge lordy. Okay. Tell me. As the resident I'm not woman. a good judge on that. You know, I'm, my, yeah. I'm a pretty edge lordy <laughs> person, <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> but I want to say like, man, watching this show that that's like 20 years old. You see how fashion has changed. I mean, you had a post on the thank you for shopping account. Uh, anorexia is out. Big tits are in or something to that effect. <laughs> True. Big tits were not in yet. Anorexia was still in when this came out. And critical support for the body positivity movement. Because these skeletal bodies of Nicole and Paris are so thin. And the jeans are so low rise that at multiple points they have to blur out Paris's ass crack when she has to do <laughs> something. Yeah. Growing up up and that was crazy because Paris was just so thin. Nicole Richie mm -hmm. ended up having like an eating disorder like right after. Surprise. Yeah, right. It was such an impossible standard. Yeah. yeah She's I, looking a lot better now. And mm -hmm. then this is Paris doc. Yeah. Like healthier, better. Yeah. I actually found out this is something she left out of her book, but I read an article from 2001 where she changed the story. But the reason she got that David LaChapelle photo shoot was because the model they wanted to use was too big and <laughs> they needed someone Jesus thinner. Christ. And Paris Hilton says that in the interview in 2001. And she's like, oh, yeah, I was thin enough to do it. So I cut in the clothes and they had to get rid of this Kicked other Kicked out girl. the whale. And <laughs> yeah. and yeah. I'm like, that's something she left out of the book in 2020. Because <laughs> she does say, oh, I got like, an emergency page and I went over there right away. Brilliant business lady. <laughs> we need someone hyper thin. Emergency page. Come, skinny lady. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> emergency now. Do not now. eat before coming. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> right. That's hot. That's hot. <laughs> If you eat anything, it better be cotton balls. They have no calories, but they make you feel full. Okay. <laughs> <feel> full. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to themes, shall we? This first section I have is just about Paris Hilton as being, uh, I don't know if there's actually a term for this. I'm calling it being class transgressive. So I think a, a big mm. part of her value add is that she's someone from one of these American aristocracy families who has grown up with old money and a blue blooded family. And she's tarnishing that. She's wearing the Playboy vest. She's doing the topless photo shoot. She that's the whole premise of the simple life is what if we took this blue blooded woman and made her roll around in the mud? And I think that that is just like a very interesting idea that she plays with this idea of slumming. It. The trucker hats. Yes. Yeah, of yes. The trucker hats, the short skirts. I wouldn't say that the way she dresses is elegant. Typically, it's very loud. Mm -hmm. A lot of bright colors, revealing outfits. And so she... Which was considered low class. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And I think that's why she makes it into the tabloids a lot in the early 2000s is, hey, here's this Hilton heiress, Paris the heiress, they called her, and mm -hmm. she's wearing a short skirt and mesh top, and she's going to the club every night. And yeah, there's just, there's a lot of excess. I don't know if I can put this in the right kind of words, but yes, we do love our lifestyles of the rich and famous in America. We love our MTV cribs. There's a sense in which we love to see the excess of celebrities and blue bloods and what have you, but I think Paris kind of takes it to a whole new level. When you combine that excess with weight, I don't know. Maybe I'm being too aspirational in how I view it, but in the dock, you see she has these cluttered rooms and closets because she's transitioned from socialite to influencer. So now, on top of all the shit she buys, she gets sent free shit. And we'll talk about this more when we talk about influencer culture, but when you go around her house and it's messy like, like a child's room and she talks about, I've never worn most of these things. I think there's a certain transgressive element to being like this frivolous with the wealth, not even really appreciating what you have, you know? And being obsessed with saying she wants to get to like a billionaire or something she wants to make it to a bill yeah yeah but she's just also just like she's spending all of 
it. Yeah, so let's move on to influencer culture and what it means for Paris Hilton to be the first influencer. She's famous for being famous. Paris Hilton puts this story in her book, and from what I can tell, it's completely apocryphal. But this is how she puts it, is that her agent, when her agent meets her for the first time, tells her, when Impressionist painters first started doing Impressionist paintings, people called them the squiggly line people because we didn't have the word Impressionism yet. Mm. But these squiggly line people became Impressionist painters, and that's what you are. You're a thing that doesn't exist yet that will one day be very common. And it is true to a certain extent. She was one of the first people to have all of this attention and notoriety and have to turn that attention into money somehow. And that is Mm -hmm. the question for thousands of people across the world now. Instagram influencers. The number one problem is I have millions of people seeing me and seeing my stuff. How do I transfer that attention into money? And there's a Mm -hmm. a famous book, The Attention Economy, that, that talks about this. This is happening a lot at the turn of the millennium. Think about Napster. The variable cost to sharing something is now zero. But how do I turn attention into money? And Sam and I laugh all the time about how badly people do this. There's that Instagram account, Sunny Side Up, <laughs> who started a podcast. This guy has like two million followers and he started the world's worst podcast. And it has less listeners than ours does, which is hilarious because he has <laughs> millions of followers and he chose the one industry that is harder to monetize than Instagram but everyone influencer. does it though. Everyone thinks like, oh, podcasting, so fun, so easy. Yeah, you oh know? yeah, like so it's, neoliberal hell did it. They like, all, uh, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, Meghan Markle, <laughs> like, or, and Harry, I think they did it as oh, well. Neoliberal they, hell and Meghan Markle, two very similar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have a theory that they're the same person. They actually. are. <laughs> yeah, have you ever seen them in the room together? No. <laughs> uh, Obama, you know? Obama yeah. as well. Uh, yeah. Maybe he's well, part Obama of Obama and Bruce Springsteen, <laughs> yeah. A guy who's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and an ex-president get together to collaborate on a project. And what is it? Their opinions on things. <laughs> it's a fucking podcast. But it's like, talk about not understanding, like, the value add that they bring to the table. Here's a random anecdote where, like, Marvin Gaye was a janitor at Motown Records. And you can just imagine it, right? We can fill in the blanks of this story. <laughs> He's mopping around. He sings in his beautiful, perfect Marvin Gaye voice. And, you know, Barry Gordy, the chief of Motown Records, is like, get this man a record deal. We are misusing his talent no the first thing they put marvin gay on was drums it's like one of the greatest singers in rock and roll history the first thing they did was put him on drums it's like being looking at michael jordan being like okay but like uh, can he play hockey right like can he can he do a slap shot or whatever like having fucking bruce springsteen and obama do a podcast <laughs> is like that right like this is not your value add uh-huh. leave the podcasting to us the shuffle boys the, the, shuffle, boys. <laughs> the shuffle boys <laughs> yeah <laughs> no the shufflers are the fans we're the shuffle oh, boys so, I'm so sorry everyone <laughs> If we can just take this out, I'm, I didn't mean to offend. But every way that like influencers try to make money now, Paris Hilton has already done and done successfully in some way or form, right? Whether it's like a makeup line or shilling for crypto or <laughs> like an OnlyFans or... Did she do OnlyFans? Well, no, but I, I mean, like that's what I'm saying. Like you can, she's done some form of that already. Sex well, tapes. she didn't really mean to do the OnlyFans, Giordano. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think she chose. <laughs> <laughs> chose that but yeah. no I said, but either way it's still griffs right mm-hmm. yeah oh she DJs I mean and and I'm not going to knock her too much for her DJing because she has been going to clubs She's since she was 16 the highest paid DJ in the world okay. million DJ. bucks a pop <laughs> uh-huh. it's crazy I do think Trudeau that she did- has an understanding of like how to have fun at the club and like create a good atmosphere for people so like I'm not going to knock her DJing but is it DJ Polly D who's the number one <laughs> number, does, <laughs> does he get paid not. more no. no I think he gets paid like he's like one of those people who are like up there he gets paid like a ridiculous amount Gross. It's true. Is it? Oh my god. No, that wow. makes me think like, oh wow, reality TV stars. Yeah, exactly. One. Like, how do I turn notoriety into money? Oh, mm-hmm. I can become a DJ, mm-hmm. right? It's like people will come to the club knowing that I'll be there playing the music. I'm connecting. I'm helping <laughs> you out. I'm connecting. <laughs> you I, I saw you struggling, Jordano. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was helping you out. <laughs> You're doing great, Sam. I, I mean, tell Jordano that. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought you were. <laughs> And this thing that Paris Hilton was either the inventor of or the forerunner of is now basically how like all of advertising works. You know, when you choose a local restaurant to eat at, chances are it's a saved spot in your phone that you saw on TikTok. It used to be that you would like watch a commercial, be like, oh, I should check out this Olive Garden. 
or this P.F. Chang's. Now, if you're like me, you have a bunch of places saved in your phone because someone on TikTok did a review. And one of the issues with this is that you don't know which posts are sincere, right? Like this is the inherent problem with the attention economy. I was telling a friend recently that I wanted to eat at this restaurant and she was like, oh, they're one of my clients and she works in PR and told me that the restaurant had paid her agency to send money to influencers to go eat there and then post about how cute it was. And then I see those posts and I'm like, oh, that must mean the restaurant's good because these people said it was. Just completely bypassing the part of your brain that normally looks at things skeptically because of this personal endorsement. And that's where Paris gets this reputation as being the first influencer, someone who's a tastemaker and whose personal preference for something is espoused as being sincere and is worth a lot of money. But we were thinking like, you know, how do how do we monetize thank you for shopping? You know, can you host Can we D- turn this podcast about that? <laughs> yeah. Can you host a DJ night at one of these knitting horrible factory. I should and I could and I would. So anyone at the knitting factory <laughs> All right, now comes the part of the program where we just list Brooklyn venues that we like. St. Okay. Vitus, The Knitting Factory, Our Wicked Lady. Knockdown uh, Center. The Horseshoe mm-hmm. Tavern. The Horseshoe House of Tavern. Yes. It's, so anyway, we were thinking maybe you could release like a makeup line. You know, you like think I should make, okay. Bright purple eyeshadow. Uh-huh, because you know? I famously do that. Bright purple <laughs> eyeshadow. Which, listen, there's no bad ideas in a brainstorm. A hundred percent. I agree with you. <laughs> you could endorse Michael Bloomberg or... Uh, that's a business right there. That's like straight up, that's my business. <laughs> <laughs> this is I endorse Michael Bloomberg. You endorse whoever comes to you. You know, Eric yeah, Adams re-election. For sure. Eric Adams, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, he's kind of an influencer. He is. That's, yeah, he's yeah. our first influencer mayor. <laughs> <laughs> He did get paid in crypto, so... I can't stand him. I hate him so much. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like someone's not uh, not sitting at the table of success. Yeah. But, uh... I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying no to success, actually. We were thinking uh, maybe you could release your own, thank you for shopping, vape flavor. Mm, I don't even vape. I don't vape at all. Shh, don't, you don't have to let people know. The I'm point is it's, it's a grift. Just, I could do my yeah. own Celsius flavor. Yes. No, hold on. I'm going to collab you with Celsius. It. Sorry, sorry. Uh, you need to make vapable Celsius. It's an energy drink that you vape and it's branded thank you for shopping that was like the smartest thing you've ever said genius <laughs> business <Thank> genius ben <laughs> Incredible. Yep. All those years of post-secondary education. That's the go to waste. What else do we have in our brainstorm? <laughs> Wonder, like, I feel like if you have, I'm still, I'm still on the vape. I'm sorry. Yeah. As, if you have like a hit of the Celsius vape, like, do you just, does your heart just explode like immediately? So, <laughs> it so comes vape- close. I think the idea is that it, you get as close to your heart exploding mm, as high. you can get, you know, without. It's like meth, but vapeable. Exactly. In a way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Vapeable caffeine is a thing. I, uh, is it? Yeah. In my, in my former oh, life I don't as need a grad to know this. student, in my former life, as a grad student i taught a kid who that was his business i would love that i would love that and i hate that i know that let's put these people together let's put this guy together with thank you for shopping (laughs) and create a new brand opportunity the room just explodes (laughs) the world just spins off its axis what's the flavor you would use you think well right now i'm drinking a wild berry and i'm a big fan of that but in general what flavor do you think says like sam i mean that's a fucking ridiculous question jordan what flavor do you tahini maybe oh my god some arab (laughs) the racism racism god damn dude oh some hummus (laughs) that's israeli what do you mean that's a totally different oh my god (laughs) (laughs) holy fuck yeah 100 percent. yeah netanyahu makes his sea salt i don't think i've ever heard of a savory vape flavor jordano i know we said there's no bad Uh ideas in a brain store but all the vape flavors are like cotton candy fucking mint Mm. bubble gum you've never heard of something umami i'm thinking Maybe like a little bit like a strawberry. I like, I'm into the berries, man. Berries. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You don't seem to agree with that flavor for me, but I don't really care because it's my business. But I'm noticing, I'm noticing your, your I'm, vibe I'm right now. I'm wondering if the flavor could be a little bit more Eastern. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little, maybe maybe a like a little. An, um, a mandarin orange or... Uh, <laughs> no, Chinese. Is that where we're going with this? <laughs> what would sitar taste uh-huh. like as a flavor, uh-huh. you know? Uh-huh. Well, you're about to find out. Have my vape. <laughs> well, listen, there's no bad idea in a brainstorm. We also thought maybe... Maybe you could have a thank you for shopping brand of Narcan. Oh, you know, yeah, that's nice because <laughs> yeah. I'm a good person. You're a good person. That's the number one thing I think I'm about a, you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I think everyone thinks that actually. Yeah, I'm into that.
that, a little Narcan. Maybe we can add a little spice to it. It's a Narcan, but like, because Narcan goes up your nose, typically. There's a nose one, and then there's another one, which I don't really understand, but I know there's a nose one. Okay. It would be cool if you could, like, we could add, like, a little flavor to it. I don't okay, know. Okay, that'd be fun. I'm spitballing. I always assumed it was, like, Pulp Fiction, and you just put it right into someone's heart. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I feel like... No, that's EpiPen. Yeah, okay. <laughs> hey, thank you for shopping EpiPen. Okay. Know? Oh. Yeah. Great. And great it's one. recreational. Yeah. For fun. Yeah. Just do it. <laughs> to get fucking jacked up. Probably get high from an EpiPen. Oh, I bet you could, man. It's an oh, upper, definitely. right? definitely. Come on. Leave a comment if you've gotten high from an EpiPen before. Can, yeah. <laughs> Viewers, please weigh in. We're thinking for like maybe a $1,000 a month. Mm -hmm. You give someone a walkie-talkie and you have the other end. And you don't necessarily have to answer it, but they just... I just, just give one person? A, or just a how, random... However many people agree to this uh Oh, operation. several. Several walkie... Okay. Yeah, so you just have like eight walkie-talkies. I would die. Yeah. <laughs> I would be so upset. <laughs> it's 96000 a year. Oh, what? It's $1,000 per walkie-talkie, right? For me? Yeah. They have, Oh, so they oh, yeah. they pay for the... Okay, I see what you're saying. They give you $1,000 a month, and as a, a recompense, they get one walkie-talkie and you have the other. I think there is at least two men in my replies <laughs> that will like would be like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll ask them. And if they say anything sexual... They will. You can even say, I'm going to turn off the walkie-talkie. No, they can just go off. I'm just not going to... You can fart into the walkie-talkie. You know? <laughs> yeah, they pay me extra for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we just thought we'd... Because <laughs> you're in your own attention economy of some kind. Have you ever tried to turn attention into money? Um, Someone paid me for foot pics before. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. That is the dream. But. I mean, it's too easy. <laughs> I'm not going to say no. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I'm not going to accept this money. You want to stare at my Who fucking cares? Yeah, of right. course. Duh. Yeah. Nice. I was offered a job as a social media for a bigger brand, and I didn't do it. But then also a PR person actually reached out to me about maybe doing brand deals. So I don't know. It's, I haven't really actually tried to, but people have fed things to me. and it's, Are you worried it would take the fun out of it maybe? or like? No, it's not that. I'm just really lazy. I think I just don't follow through because I'm a lazy person. Right. Not like Paris. Not like Paris. No, mm -hmm. she's on that grind. Yeah. Girl boss. Yeah, I do find this kind of funny that every now and then I'm I'm, I'm scrolling through the reels, dissociating after mm -hmm. work and looking at just hack TikTok comics. I hold no personal animosity to someone like corporate Natalie that has come up on my feed, but it's this lady who makes jokes about working in corporate, right? And so they're like TikTok comedy bits where it's labeled giving feedback to my Gen Z co-workers and it's an elder millennial being being like, I really loved it when you said that you ate that up on the Slack, but maybe that's not how we talk professionally. Like, that's the level of humor and comedy that we're dealing with. And every fifth one has this very awkward shoehorned in, like, attempt at a joke, but also promoting, like, actual corporate business software, NordVPN, or some kind of evil tech and That's why I use QuickBooks industry. for this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. No, QuickBooks is exactly what I was looking for for the punchline. Yes. You can every always tell because suddenly there's a joke in your feed that doesn't seem to be of the same standard you're like wait this is suddenly like a much worse joke and oh it's an ad mm -hmm. it's immediately recognizable we're still struggling with this problem today whenever someone endorses a product i want to buy it because i'm like oh my friend this anonymous person i follow on instagram <laughs> endorsed it but i have no idea if they actually like it or if they're just being paid someone actually reached out to me he and he represents this band that i'm not gonna say and he asked me if i would make memes about this band but it's press for them and it looks like I'm making a meme about them because they're just a known entity. You're not against mm. it, I guess, in principle to make jokes about this band. Oh, no, I'm not against that. It's like, yeah, whatever. I don't care. I post like 10 sli <laughs> slides in one. It doesn't matter if one's just randomly about some stupid band that I've right. never listened to. Whatever. Yeah. If you want to get an idea for what kind of grind set mentality Paris Hilton is on, she has 17 different product lines. And of course, she is the number one highest paid female DJ in the world. And she is still launching stuff, launching skincare stuff, makeup stuff. She was the first one to do a perfume line, which now it's a staple for mm. like every celebrity. The makeup one seems to be huge. That's how Kylie became a billionaire, Two, yeah. right? So she is on that grind. She has a lot of irons in the fire. And that's what I mean when I say she's the original influencer. She's like the first person to experiment with all these ways. Be like, okay, people know my Do name. Do people say irons in the fire? I'm sorry. I yeah, it's a very common expression. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Look at this antipathy <laughs> for no reason. It's just like, I I don't know, like you say these things and then like a bell goes off in my head and I'm like, what, <laughs> you know, like, what did you just say? Hey, back me up here. Who, yeah, which no, one of us is sipping cup. dumb bitch juice? I mean, I'm always <laughs> sipping. Uh, well, I'm not gonna. I'm always <laughs> sipping. No, I- so on that note, actually, that's a good place to transfer over to just be like, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Paris Hilton and I think that she is something of a business genius for creating this industry. But I do want to say that this podcast is not a hagiography because I read her book and her book oscillates between being incredibly compelling and interesting and also some of the most annoying drivel I've ever read in my life. She talks a lot about her NFT line that she's launching, which you want to talk about another way that people try to turn notoriety into money. NFTs is like one of the most shameless cash grabs that you can think of. And she'll go on and on about how she's doing her first NFT drop and she's doing it to try and bring fierce, talented women artists into this powerful new space through like a multimedia engagement platform. And I'm like, shut the fuck up. It's just a cash grab. It is not a powerful (laughs) new space for fierce women. It's a pump and dump (laughs) speculative scam. Yeah. Yeah. But I also love the degree of just shamelessness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That is what's beautiful about it, too. (laughs) of Just being not ashamed to be like, oh, yeah, this NFT thing is actually a great social thing. Yeah. And also, why should you be ashamed of selling? Like, we're all this whole entire world is on money. So I don't know. I don't see any shame in that, I guess. Her sister asks her in the doc and Paris left this in the documentary. Her sister's like, you have enough money that you never have to work again. Why don't you just stop working if you're so tired? And Paris says, Mm -hmm. I can't. There's too much money to be made from me working. I think she's just running away from her own self. Personally, she's working all the time. so She doesn't have to think and deal with trauma and like herself, period. Yeah, she doesn't seem like someone who would like to just sit and relax. Yeah, she seems avoidant. Right. Dude, the section of the doc when she was on Mykonos, one of the most beautiful places on earth, and she changes outfits eight times or whatever (laughs) and takes a different snap in a different area of the infinity pool that looks onto the bay of Mykonos or whatever. And there's this scene that was truly heartbreaking to me where she's in this relationship that she's excited about that ends over the course of the doc. She walks into the bedroom and this German guy that she's dating has left rose petals that say I heart you on the bed. You know how hard it is for a German to put I don't think he's German dude. His last name ends in V-I-C. I I think that is a Serbian man and I think he's definitely the child of like a fucking war criminal. Can we talk about that guy for a second? Because I thought he was one of the most hateable figures I've ever seen in my entire life. 100%. Could I just finish this story Uh though? Hold on one second. So Paris Hilton, this is what was so sad. She sees the rose petals on the bed. It short circuits her brain. She says, that's nice. (laughs) So romantic. I thought the same thing when I was watching it. She's like so uncomfortable with it. She immediately takes out her phone and does a snap of it because it's the only way she can know how to process the feelings is mediated through the telephone and social media. She's on Mykonos and she checks her screen time and is down because she's on vacation. It's only six hours a day. She says normally it's 16 hours a day. Jordan said it's not a hagiography of Paris Hilton. I am on Team St. Paris Hilton. (laughs) She is a victim of fucking human trafficking and abusive parents and an abusive fucking cult and she's just trying to avoid the trauma. Like Sam said, she's avoided. This is the only coping mechanism that she has. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I completely understand that. Hiding with the phone or hide. I mean, we all do avoid. Maybe I just read too much of her book and I had a hard time <laughs> taking her on a pedestal. In that book, <laughs> she uses the line, ADHD is my superpower so many times, sincerely, <laughs> where I'm like, that is a made up disease. And I don't know what your opinion is on this. <laughs> I have been diagnosed with ADD. I've been taking Adderall and Vyvanse for 12 years, and I think it's made up. So why don't you stop taking Adderall and Vyvanse? Yeah, my life would be harder. But you don't need it, though, you, you feel. Yeah, right. Well, we don't need, no one needs anything, right? Well, I mean, you need heart oh, medication, we all have maybe. Needs. There's like a whole hierarchy that Maslow talked about. So we, have lo- we have lots of ease in that. Talk about him. Talk about Maslow. But she spends the first chapter of her book <laughs> describing her ADHD diagnosis and why it's her superpower. I think we need to calm down with the ADD talk but it's tiktokified now yeah i don't know if it's made up but i think when you see ads for like we will diagnose you over the <laughs> internet and send you add <laughs> medication in the mail i think okay maybe we're cheapening the legitimate diagnosis there are people who have legitimate struggles with executive function i think i have add you should get a diagnosis yeah we all do no but i think i have it I more than all of you so. than me even <laughs> yeah. so i i mean i, I take i take 
take I take the drugs. All my family does as well. And I remember actually when I got my diagnosis, I had to go to speak to this therapist and I had to fill out this paperwork. And they were like, this paperwork actually has to be filled out by a friend. And so I brought it to my friend and he filled it out. To say what? Like, he can't concentrate ever. <laughs> yeah, my like, friend no. is dumb. Like, please help him. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I wish he would have wrote that because what Joe wrote extensively about, which I didn't read before giving to my therapist. I wanted to read it, but I got distracted. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have ADD anyway. <laughs> He's like your friend, right? I mean, keep in mind, this was 2008. He's like, your friend writes a lot about how you have confused gender identity and how about you don't <laughs> you don't feel comfortable in the body that you're in. And he's like, let's talk about that. And I'm like, I promise you, he is fucking with me. <laughs> and like, I'm trying to tell the therapist, like, I have thought about my gender identity before. And I, I don't think it's the case for me personally. I really would like to get back to the ADD diagnosis. I asked I love the wrong guy to read. do this. I love that you just didn't read. You just like blindly trusted Why would him. I read it? No, I mean, you're, I a good, you're, you're a great friend. You're like, this is my best pal. Trust True. him with my life and my medication. And now let's quickly talk about the yugoslav war criminal that you brought oh up my God. Yeah, so in the doc in that story that i talked about that spurred on that tangent yeah paris has a relationship that eventually ends during a major dj set which had one of the biggest laugh lines for me paris and her band are having a fight over dj stuff and she cuts his armband and then asks security to throw him out and afterwards she says i can't believe i cut off his armband <laughs> yeah. at a music festival that's one of the worst things you can do to <laughs> yeah person. that was awesome one of the worst things you can do to someone and i i said like paris you've been kidnapped <laughs> what, are you what are you talking about and he, the way that he is drunk is so embarrassing oh yeah he's so drunk oh. oh my god if he's ever seen that footage i hope he dies of cringing because he's so embarrassing and he's so needy too he's like yeah. you're not giving yeah. me enough attention why are you <laughs> and she's like i'm playing tomorrowland i'm at work and he's like you don't make time for me and, and then he drops her laptop which she's supposed to use for her set and mm -hmm. yeah, i think it's the best part of the documentary Memory, honestly is watching oh, she's her. getting abused yeah. well no because she <laughs> breaks up with him it has the most drama right it's like no, the most sure, reality sure. tv like, most compelling i think mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it made me really sad to watch personally yeah well i guess i also watched it with the knowledge that i know that she's happily married now with carter yeah so true i was like oh she's gonna get over this and find one of the richest young men in america to marry afterwards i guess it's just sad because it seems like she has a history of men who are just controlling and abusive so yeah because of the yeah, I mean, we can talk for a second about Rick Salomon, her ex-boyfriend, whose nickname was Scum. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. So she dated this guy when she was 18. He is a professional poker player. You know, a tale as old as time. He was a professional <laughs> poker player. She was a socialite. Mm -hmm. Can I make it any more obvious? Great song. <laughs> <laughs> And this is the guy who pressures her to make the sex tape and then releases it. I think the website he sets up to release the tape is called spoiled.com. Yeah, this guy would go on after Paris Hilton to marry, I think, Pamela Anderson. Oh, wow. Despite being known as scum. <laughs> You've never dated a scum. I mean, I have, but they're not known as scum. Like, that's like pretty, like, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> if only the red flags were more right. present. I'm out here looking for my scum wiener, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very funny in the doc hearing his defense of his revenge porn tape that he made, even though everything about it is so toxically masculine. And yes, she was slut shamed and this is revenge porn is awful. But the language that he uses is the language of sex positivity. He's like, there's nothing untoward on that tape. It's just a couple people enjoying nice, good, consensual They're sex. They're in love. Right? It's two people in love. They're in love. <laughs> yeah, he even says love, yeah. right? Wow. This is why you're scum, man. This is why you're in that nickname. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about It Girls and Socialites and Paris Hilton is what we have in the late 90s and early 2000s. And I want to ask a little bit about what do our It Girls say about our society? I looked up It Girls from across the decades and Vanity Fair and fashion magazines will typically not name Paris Hilton an It Girl, but lowbrow publications will. And it usually describes a type of person who can ascend into the public consciousness for their looks and personality. And in the 50s, Marilyn Monroe does this by appearing in pinup magazines or painted on the side of a b-52 a lot of impressions a lot of, a lot impressions. of impressions on the b-52 <laughs> sides <laughs> that was how you got your figure out there and 
the 80s, you have advertisements for luxury products that are appealing to a new upper class. And in the 90s, I really do feel like this is the high watermark for tabloids. And Paris Hilton is a tabloid fixture in the late 90s and early 2000s. And she actually gasses that up a bit. She flirts with all the paparazzi people, she says. She's friendly to them, unlike most people leaving the club. She'll remember their names and talk to them mm. and give them something, right? She's like Be a politician, scandalous. basically. Yeah, the way exactly. She was, yeah. she was able to sell herself into this system. And I think about just the power of these tabloids at the time. When Paris Hilton gets out of the hospital in the, I think it's the second season of Simple Life, there's 25 photographers waiting outside the hospital in Arkansas for her to get out. And I'm like, a photo of her leaving the hospital is worth so much money that it can pay for the labor of 25 people to fly there and wait for her to get out. That's how much these photos are worth. And this is like pre-social media age, right? This system is the only reasonable allocation of resources. <laughs> yeah, capitalism is the forget. perfect system and finds the most efficient use of resources. Can we end the podcast right there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, done. Yeah. We are a pro-capitalist sponsored by Donald Trump. <laughs> and... <laughs> Since then, we've moved to like a social media dominated tabloid space, I think. And if you look at the people that have ascended in this new space, people like Kendall Jenner and Kim Kardashian, the direct link to Paris Hilton is there. Kim Kardashian was Paris Hilton's assistant in the late 2000s. And a lot of people speculate. I don't know if it's true. I know that I've had a few ex-girlfriends try to explain to me that like Kris Jenner released Kim Kardashian's sex tape or something because she saw the path that Paris Hilton was able to take to get into the public consciousness. And so I think that Paris Hilton is the socialite for this era and she perfectly embodies all the ways that someone would have become famous through the tabloids at first and then through reality TV and then through social media. Yeah, and did we mention that Kim quite literally was Paris' assistant? Yeah, I said that in my rant. Okay, shit, sorry. I, wasn't, <laughs> I got a little bit of ADD, ADHD. I got then a little, it little, is your little superpower, distracted. I would say, honestly. <laughs> There's some video or something, it's a short clip, where it's a fan going up to Paris Hilton and Kim is right next to her. And the fan totally ignores Kim because Kim's irrelevant at this point <laughs> and just goes to Paris and is like, can I take a picture with you? And Kim is just, just like pushed out of the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's really, it's a really uh -huh. a cute video because it as, just shows the difference in times and whatever. As Ben always says, that was her, they call me Mr. Glass moment, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think this is huge. It's worth stressing how consequential this is. I'm sure a lot of listeners kind of roll their eyes when they saw that the episode was on Paris Hilton but I remember back in 2019 there was a poll that went around because 2019 was the 50th anniversary of the moon landing <laughs> sorry what <laughs> 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 it was just a crazy grab. I just didn't see that one coming. Wasn't ready for that one. It's okay. Sorry. Go on. <laughs> they did a poll where they compared in 1969, what do kids want to be? Of course, the overwhelming majority is like, I want to be a motherfucking astronaut, dude. I want to be a space cowboy. I want to be called Maurice. Mm -hmm. And then in 2019, the overwhelming majority of young people, when polled, said they want to be either a vlogger <laughs> or a social media <laughs> influencer. This is the majority dream of the youth. And Paris Hilton was the, the trailblazer, the first one. She's not even the Christopher Columbus. She's the motherfucking Leif Erikson. <laughs> That's how early she got here. I don't know. It was like a male friend of hers. And wait, she like took her camera, turned it on herself, and she took a picture. And that was like a selfie. But, yes. but at that time, he personally had never seen that before. But it speaks to her just constantly being one step ahead of the trends. And mm -hmm. Yeah, the doc, which I think we should mention maybe here. We could have done it earlier. The doc is a officially a Paris Hilton doc that's associated with the Paris Hilton YouTube channel. Yeah, the doc does seem to claim that she invented the concept of the selfie. Before there was a smartphone with a front-facing camera, she was the first person, this is getting into like weird like fucking absolute dictator territory, she was the first person to think to turn the camera around and take a photo of yourself. Right, I know, and that struck me too, and I was like, I don't know if that, <laughs> but I do think she probably, maybe she saw it somewhere else, or I don't know, but she was doing it before it was like super mainstream, I guess. Yeah, what does that say? I guess if all the kids want to be the pacemakers, essentially, professionally. Okay. I want to choose things that are good. Well, here's the deal. If the economy continues to be so fake, if interest rates come down, we can make that happen. This is our society's best attempt at a universal basic income. You're going to post a lot and we're going to have a whole lot of like Saudi Arabian oil money and negative interest loans out of Silicon Valley so that you can promote fucking WeWork and NordVPN and Manscaped. It all comes back to this trail blazing woman. So moving on a little bit to echoes in the culture, I think that she lives on, I think, through her 
her fashion choices. I think she was an incredibly fashionable person who made a lot of loud decisions that people took note of with clothes. She's sort of famous for the tracksuits and the fuzz. The tracksuits were kind of revolutionary (laughs) (laughs) because it was so like you didn't wear fucking comfy ass clothes out like that. Mm, Right. That was so slouchy. And so she made it and then with like the bedazzledness of it, Mm -hmm. she just made it so sick. And you're something of a fashionista yourself. I'm a big one. (laughs) You've been on watching New York. I did go on. Yeah. Sam has awesome outfits. Did you ever look up to Paris Hilton or think about her sense of style? I think I looked up to her actually when I was younger. Yeah, I definitely had a Juicy Couture set when Mm. I was like 13. I definitely fucked around with that. Yeah. Yeah. I have one now, which I never wear, but I just have (laughs) to have it. She still wears the tracksuits, which is awesome in the documentary when she's around the house. The tracksuit is the platonic ideal of clothing. (laughs) It is form and function. I got the full Adidas tracksuit. Why didn't you wear it for for this episode? Uh, I know. We should have all worn. Yeah, damn. I will leave you guys with a a great quote about Paris Hilton and fashion, Mm -hmm. which is that always remember you wear the clothes. The clothes don't wear you. (laughs) (laughs) I've never once thought that my clothes wore me, but now I do. I would love to say that to someone at a bar. (laughs) Just say it and then like walk away. (laughs) Thanks for the drink and just remember. (laughs) I think she means that the energy you bring to the outfit at the end of the day is more important than the actual items of clothing. Yeah, but it's so, it's like a troll under the bridge. It's a little like riddle way of saying it. Like I just don't, yeah. I'm also projecting that. I don't know if that's actually what she meant, but. I assume, what else could she I read that and I was like, you know what? Great point, Paris. I'm going to remember that next time I wear my 9-11 t-shirt. I'm not even kidding. I'm I'm going to drop it. (laughs) To a random person. And just be like so like matter of fact about it. Mm -hmm. Not even, I'm going to practice so I don't laugh. Self-evident what I mean by that. See what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> that should be Paris Hilton's 18th company that she founds, a Paris Hilton book of proverbs. Just <laughs> yeah, yeah. kernels of wisdom like that. I'd pay good money. She for that. has trademarked so many phrases. Oh, In her really? book, she always mentions, I trademark this sentence after someone said it to me or after I said it. <laughs> so funny she is conrad hilton she is like her great grandfather's silving yeah where it's like if there's an opportunity to make money off something and i say something that i think is clever i'm trademarking it god she's such a hustler hustler mindset grinder Mm -hmm. she's Mm -hmm. on grinder she's on grinder (laughs) paris hilton is on is fucking on grinder so yeah paris's life since then she went to jail in 2007 for driving on a suspended license and only because who amongst us by the way (laughs) (laughs) no really I, I can't <laughs> done that. But anyway, go really? yeah. It's fine. <laughs> Only because... A victimless crime. Yeah, truly. <laughs> the judge that she got wanted to punish her. This is a judge who came out of retirement to try this case, to throw the book at her. Getting back to what we were talking about in our, like... She's op- a woman hater. Opening she hook, hates other women. It was a man. Okay, that yeah. too. <laughs> so he's just a regular guy. <laughs> Misogynist, that. Yeah. <laughs> who is like, I'm going to give her the maximum sentence of 45 days He wanted in to prison. fuck her. He wanted to fuck her. And he was mad that he couldn't so he was yeah, like that going is to prison why people bad are angry with her i think they yeah. want to have sex with her and and so he sent her to jail <laughs> for driving on a suspended sentence to throw the book at her to punish this woman who is being the so whore. frivolous mm-hmm. and life can be unfair to her because like i said we don't have any actual class politics we just want to punish this one I see woman. her as like a jesus christ figure <laughs> like she like takes all our sins away and we're nasty to her and we spit at her and she's just being crucified mm-hmm. exactly and also getting a ton of money while she well, does it again She's taking away the sins of the rich and powerful. Exactly. Right? She's like, Jesus. Uh, yeah, yeah. Not our sins. <laughs> She's We're taking my sins away. Ben. <laughs> <laughs> she has a new reality TV show, Paris in Love. I watched it. It's really a tough, tough, Why tough is it watch. tough? Why is it bad? Because Nicole Richie is the personality behind A Simple Life. And I think that Paris Hilton has an avoidant personality. So the, I think the episodes that I watched were like, oh, Paris is having a party, but she doesn't want to talk to anybody. So she stays upstairs while her guests are downstairs. And a lot of it is about trying to talk to her mom mom about what she went through and her mom her mom is hilarious she puts on lip gloss like every three seconds (laughs) and just will try to leave the room anytime paris is like no i went to that school and you know they (laughs) abuse me and she's like well what does abuse mean she also accuses paris of using a ghostwriter to write her book which was very funny but i really feel like nicole richie is the charisma behind the simple life and it was it was tough to watch she's also a mother now and she has this nanny that seems to take care and i'm like i'm not knocking her for that but she does have to pick up the kid in the, the show and they make a point to show that she does 
not know how to pick up a baby at on all. On her show? They're yeah, like, yeah. Paris doesn't know how to pick up. I think they make the point. Because his head's really One of the things they're, they're like... laughing at is like, Paris <laughs> never actually has to deal with her child. Well, why would they? Isn't it the show like he made the show? Why would? Again, she's a business Because she's playing the if role. she thinks it'll make the show better, maybe. No, now I'm like, I want to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She has to play the role that people want from yeah, her. She's the villain we need, but didn't uh, deserve or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Paris Hilton's not Jesus. Paris Hilton, Batman. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, definitely. That as well. Because she can be both. And or mm-hmm. She has many masks. That's true. Yeah. Rich socialite. Ooh, rich socialite like Bruce Maybe Wayne. There you go, this. yeah. One heartwarming thing in terms of what Paris is up to now is that she is trying to do something good for victims of abuse in the in the troubled teen industry. At the end of the doc, she has this big reunion with some of the people who are at the Provo, Utah camp with her. And it's very heartwarming, but she really does not know how to be a human with emotions because these people have had horrendous brutal lives some of them have just gone in and out of other re- abusive relationships largely due to the abuse that they suffered as children and literally as these people come into paris's mansion she greets them with like hey how's everyone doing <laughs> or whatever. what is she She's supposed like... to do though like, <laughs> like i don't know how else, how do you greet people like you just say like get in like i don't know like get, get yeah, the fuck no, in fair. here i don't i don't know <laughs> take a cane and just pull them in I don't <laughs> like a vaudeville act. Yeah. Yoink. <laughs> Sorry, the exact line was, so how's everybody else doing? Because she, she has one really emotional connection with the first person she knows, and she turns to the other three and goes, so how's everybody else doing? Yeah, so anyway, getting a little hot in here, yeah. huh? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody want some water? Or? And I'm sure she crunched the numbers and that this, like, talking about this was a good business decision for her, but initially you hear her say, I never wanted to talk about the abuse because it wasn't part of the brand. And everything she does in life is filtered through the brand. Also, she publicly have to talk about, about her abuse sure i think some of the people who are fighting the good fight the one victim who's the super activist organizing the whole campaign i think she really wanted her to for a while f- for the exposure and whatnot to help like whatever but yeah it was a very heartwarming end to the doc and paris hilton should hate her family a lot more but doesn't mm-hmm. yet the mom says when they finally have some kind of conversation about it, the mom says and i wrote this down had we known we would have been there in a second you watched her being pulled out of your home like by strange yeah. men like you- there were four different school work camps <laughs> right like of increasing she severity kept running away like I, I don't i don't know it's just so it's just really sad that they were just like yeah she's stupid she's running away she's just a brat yeah and her parents talk yeah. about having to sleep in front of the door to make sure paris doesn't go clubbing and it, it does seem like they kind of threw their hands up pretty early on and we're like <laughs> we've tried nothing we're all out of ideas yeah you've got to help us doc we've tried nothing and we're all out of ideas paris hilton loves animals and there's a scene where they are asked if they want to help defeather a chicken and the music that the producers play are these ominous tones with synthesizer that sound like a john carpenter movie <laughs> like we're in the antarctic base and the thing is about to burst out to of be that fair, chicken's if chest. somebody asked me to do that that's the exact sound i would hear <laughs> as well for real i haven't eaten meat in like 12 years so if someone asked oh, me to dang. do that i would just it would be that sound mm-hmm. it would be ominous mm-hmm. Those horrible feathers freak me out. Oh, I, I'd learn a new skill. Well, good for you. Dude, the world's going to collapse. You might as well learn how to fucking. <laughs> Are you a prepper? Pluck a bird. Are you a prepper? I feel like no, you're getting. This is, this is your way. No, because like, because like, 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 like you, Sam. Call back. I'm like too lazy to prep. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I just am pretty convinced things aren't no, getting to be better. Fair, at one point, I, I mean, I still, I shouldn't be saying. That. Okay, at one point, at one point, I, I used to store a bunch of cash because in my head I was like, the banks are gonna. Go. <laughs> the banks, Hell. but I. I really yeah. do believe it. Speaking of all the normie fans that we're going to get coming into this episode. <laughs> oh, <I'm sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so hopefully we've learned a little bit about why Paris Hilton is a perfect embodiment of so many things from the 2000s, including what it means to be the first influencer, what it means to embody some of the toxic masculinity of the era and the troubled teen industry and fashion. What it means to sublimate our class resentments into the hatred of one specific woman. <laughs> yes. Jesus. You can tell a lot about a society by who it chooses as a heel. And, a and, and we were not fair to Paris sultan i think it's a weird thing to say go watch some of the south park scenes where they make fun of paris hilton it is so difficult to watch the whole joke that south park runs with is that she releases i think either a toy or a makeup line called the stupid spoiled 
video playset and she like i think kills people by shoving them up her vagina and <laughs> <laughs> like that is the tone of what we wanted to see i love south park can i just say it's genius it's so ridiculous sorry go ahead <laughs> okay, uh, welcome everyone uh the south park chamber of commerce is pleased to bring you the first annual who is the biggest <laughs> showdown <laughs> I need to get wasted. I haven't had a drink in like 14 minutes. Why is everybody so stupid anyway? I flashed all these hicks in my boobs. You should have seen the look on their faces, stupid redneck idiot. Ah! Oh dear. Another dog killed itself. I don't know. I, I watched that and I was like, this fucking sucks. No, like, it's bad. It's terrible. But I find that when Cometown makes fun of something, the joke is so ridiculous and insincere. When Cometown says that like Ray Romano is a pedophile, I think the joke is that this is so, so ridiculous that they don't sincerely endorse that. But mm. I really do feel like the creators of South Park think that Paris Hilton is a stupid spoiled but and that's that why they're making the joke. a hundred thousand percent the time though. Like that's how women, girls at that time, there was slut, slut shaming was a major, major thing. And she just rose to fame at that exact time when it was at a fucking height. Who was that guy that was um, a comedian? <laughs> No, wait, like Mac, Max Tucker? Oh, Tucker Max. <laughs> Tucker yeah. Max. He's not a comedian. Famously not a comedian. But, uh, yeah, you know, but he's, he, he's a writer. Yeah, whatever, he's whatever. But you, you have to say, like, he was big and he was, his whole thing was about how he was fucking all these sluts and da 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 Oh, I, I want to do an episode on him at some point. You should come on for that if you I, want. Yeah. I read all of his books. I don't know who this guy is. It's who good is? that you don't. He was not. Okay. He basically Stay wrote, wholesome, He was a blogger you know? turned writer, Tucker Max. Mm. He invented the genre of fratire. It was called. It was exactly what that time was. He wrote about how he would have sex with women and how about how he would denigrate them. And stuff. He was like basically <laughs> a precursor to pick up artists, I think, in some ways. Sure. But you guys want to know what he's up to now? Is mm -hmm. he he's in a jail? prepper. He has moved out to Texas. Oh he oh bought God. a ranch Hell where he raises yeah. his own cows, owns like a thousand guns and has wells because he is convinced that the world is going to end and that he needs to have access to his own agriculture. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that, Ben. I knew <laughs> That's it. Awesome, You've been waiting to launch this i feel it <laughs> i almost bought government foreclosed property in texas <laughs> during the pandemic land that you can't grow anything on because it's deep mm -hmm. in the in the deserts of west texas and i'm mm -hmm. like but that way i'll have it yeah you know? the oh. banks are gonna close yeah i'm with <laughs> yeah. you man yeah man okay well sounds like sam sam sounds like you and i are founding Listen, the compound jordano oh, you can dude. apply we can and we'll see not to be you know i think we could do a little culty stuff there not to be weird i just think compound reminds me of holtz why have a compound if you're not gonna okay, have a cult great. to go no, with it i mean know? i i'm not saying it, it sounds like you're saying it so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sure i guess ben if that's what you Listen, want to do jim jones had a lot of things right if you look into his politics mm -hmm. so sure. anyway yeah. thanks for joining us for this discussion on paris hilton <laughs> 2000s mm -hmm. iconic her, girl figure who really taught us all how to turn attention into money by being one of the mm -hmm. great uh, business icons girl, <laughs> girl, bosses girl bosses of, of the era <laughs> she walks up hillary clinton <laughs> could run <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to learn to be more fashionable or just more shameless about business and just about how to be a strong person i think that paris hilton can be a very commendable figure all right thank you so much for joining us please like please subscribe Follow, thank you for shopping yes absolutely sam has like one of the best instagram accounts of all time i think she has the best instagram account of all time sam every day i go there to see her collage that she puts together with great care i love the clothes i, do love so I love my the music choices i love the way that they all the pictures uh, have like this meshing that ties them together like ideologically mm -hmm. yeah i just keep stroking my ego man i'm, I'm into i'm like yeah that's right yeah <laughs> Uh, yeah. So yeah, we'll put a link to that in the show notes. And a huge thank you to our guests for coming on. Subscribe, like, follow. Yeah. Thank you for shopping, as well as our and pod. the Shuffle Boys. Yeah, the Shuffle yeah. Boys. And for more, Sam, you can listen to the Hipster episode uh -huh. as well. And for more on toxic masculinity, I would recommend you check out the Spike TV episode that we did, episode 17. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, thanks so much for coming on. And if you want to help us out, you know, maybe give us a shout out on Instagram and tag us. We'd love to repost it. And if you want some stickers, let me know. I'll, I'll I'll mail you some. Sick. All right. Have a good one. Ciao, All ciao. Right, bye. Peace.